Hi, this is Sarit Switzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 263 for the 15th of Av in a leap year. So when we think about babies, typically speaking, we usually assume that they don't know what's going on. We assume that they're kind of out of it, that we can say anything in their presence, we can do anything in their presence, and they don't really get it. They don't really understand. Interestingly, according to Judaism, this isn't actually correct. According to Judaism, babies actually do understand everything, in fact. The only thing is they can't communicate. They can't speak. Speech is something that is developed later on. And there's a whole uh, study, science of, of speech and language and how that gets developed th- first through babbling and first through, even in the case of, uh, of deaf kids, I remember studying this, it was really interesting. Even in the case of, of kids that are deaf, they also babble, but they'll babble with their hands they'll, in sign language, that kind of thing. And there's a whole process whereby speech happens. And so today we're, we're going to talk about this a little bit. We're going to talk about the idea of speech and why it would be that a baby would not be able to speak. Because what, what we'll learn is that speech actually comes from a place, the origin of and the, the, what gives us the ability to speak is actually from a place that we might not have thought of at first glance. Like superficially speaking, when you think about speech right now, when I'm speaking, when I'm, when I'm talking these words, when I'm you know, giving over this podcast, then there's a very mechanistical process that happens. Like somebody could look at my lips, they could look at my teeth, they could look at my tongue, they could see the movement of all of these things, the uh, the intonations of my voice in, in the throat, and how much I'm constricting my throat or not constricting my throat, all these things are going on. But am I conscious of these things while I'm speaking? No, not at all. What I'm conscious of is what I want to say. What I'm conscious of is I want to give over cer- certain information. I want to say specific words. And kind of almost miraculously, it seems, my mouth forms into specific ways of speaking. And this isn't just because it's like, oh, it's become habitual at this point. There was never really a point in my life, or I don't think in anybody's life, if if you can think about it, that we learn how to speak by breaking down the mechanistic processes, right? Like it's, it's like, let's say, you know, when you were first taught how to say the word baby, it's like, you know, there, sure, there are speech therapists that will sometimes come and kind of like, if, if a kid is having trouble with like specific words or specific um, vocalizations or whatever, they might break it down in this more mechanistic way. But generally speaking, you think about a, a, a child, the first word that they, that they utter out of their mouth, dada, mama, you know, baby, whatever it is, it's not that they're learning the mechanism of how to do it. Something else is going on. There's like a switch that happens in the brain where their brain can now communicate. Their brain, what was kind of like way up there somewhere hidden in their mind, now has become revealed and now becomes translated into being able to express through speech. So what this is, this mechanism, the switch that happens, as we'll learn today, is something called chokhmah. It's it's something that we've brought up before. And it's this, like, we can think of it as intuitive we can think of it as a spark of insight. It's this deeper kind of like super rational part of the brain that uh, that is beyond words. It's beyond um, understanding. It's beyond logical kind of like framework and rationality. It's something that's above it all. But interestingly, it's actually the source of it all. So when we think about like the mechanisms of speech, these are things that make sense. This is like a science, right? This is like 
in the realm of logic. But interestingly, the the origin of it all actually comes from a place that's above logic. And that's what we're going to be learning about today. But interestingly, this this whole discussion of speech and all that stuff, we'll actually see is a little bit of a tangent from a bigger and more all-encompassing topic, which the Ultra Rabbi introduces today, but he only bring uh, begins the journey for us. And that more broader, all-encompassing topic, believe it or not, is the theme of Tzedakah, which is a theme that we've been talking about for a while, and it's a very big theme in this book of Yigeris HaKodesh. And the the way that this ties in to speech, which might seem like a really big jump, is that we're going to actually talk about David HaMelech. We're going to talk about King David, and we're going to begin our discussion by exploring a somewhat obscure quote from Shmuel Bet. Uh, where it talks about how David and Hamelech made a name, Vayas David Shem. And we're, we're going to talk about what that means and how the simple explanation is that that when we talk about a name, like making a good name for yourself, it's like he built a good reputation for himself by doing a good deed, by burying the dead of his enemies. But that the Zohar kind of takes this in the next to, to a deeper place and he talks about how that when we say building a name, then we can actually understand this in a more literal sense in terms of building the name of God. And how do we build the name of God is through giving staka. And so interestingly, I, f- I always find this very interesting when it comes to Kabbalah, when it comes to the Zohar, these deeper teachings that people think of them as like so abstract and so out there. But often what they're doing is they're actually looking at things in a very literal way. They're looking at the words in this like etymological way, like really breaking it down to like what it's literally saying. So it's like when we say, you know, build building a name, we think of this in this like kind of abstract way, like, you know, building a good name, a reputation or whatever. But the the Zohar is actually bringing it down to the literal sense of that there's something about what David Melech did and what we can all do through giving tzedakah in terms of building quite literally God's name. So we're going to understand what that means. And so to, to kick off that discussion, we're going to look at the first two letters of God's name, which is the Yud and the He, as we've spoken about before. And we're going to talk about how the how they relate to each other and the difference. And and we've spoken about this somewhat before. And so today is going to be kind of like a review of that idea that the Yud is related more to the future world to come. And the He is related to our world. It says that God created the world to come with the Yud and he created our world with the He. And we're going to talk about how the Yud is related to this quality of Chochmah that we've been talking about, which is like super rational and the source and the origin of the rational world of language. Of It's like the pre-linguistic state. And in so being the pre-linguistic state, it actually is also the origin of the linguistic state of, of the bina of the of the rationality of of um, of more logical thought. So let's get into the text and see how the ultra Rabbi explains all of this. And so here we go. So the ultra Rabbi, again. So and for context, we are beginning uh, the fifth epistle of Yerusha Kodesh, and the ultra Rabbi begins this section by citing, as I mentioned, Shmuel Bet chapter 8, verse 13, where it says, Vyas David Shem, that David made a name. And then uh, the simple explanation of this, so according to Rashi, what this means is that David gave the Jewish people a good name by burying the dead of their enemies. And other commentators say said that it's actually David Amelech giving himself a good name. This was like an explanation of him giving himself a good name, like a good reputation through his heroism. So either way, then we then we go and look at the Zohar. We see that the Zohar actually relates this pasuk, this idea of David Amelech making himself a good name, to a different pasuk, namely a pasuk from Divrei Hayamim, the first part of Divrei Hayamim, uh, chapter uh, eighteen, verse fourteen, where it says, "Vayhi osemi staka lecholamo," that David Hamelech did justice and staka with all of his people. So the Zohar, uh, and so then, and then the Zohar goes on, like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai goes on, and he and he explains that the that the that staka is intrinsically linked to the idea of making the holy name. That he says, who makes the holy name every day? He who gives charity unto the poor. So he basically, like I said, he explains this in, in a more literal sense of like God's name. Like when we say a name, we're not talking about uh, David's or, or uh, the Jewish people's reputation so much, or maybe we are, but on a deeper sense, we're talking about literally God's name, God's yud Vavke, and that God's name is built and established through giving staka. So what does this mean? So to really come to understanding what this means, we're going to 
first look at the first two letters of God's name, the Yud and the He. So, and, and by looking at this, we're going to look at a verse in Yeshayahu, chapter 26, verse 4, which says, Ki beka Hashem tzu olamim. So th- this is this literally means that with the letters yud hey yud and hey Hashem formed the worlds. So what does this mean? And so the it, this is explained. So that it, this is explained in a few places in the Gemara, and I've mentioned it before as well. That this world was created with the letter hey, and the next world Olam Haba was created with the letter yud, meaning to say. That when we think about the next world, so we're first focusing on the next world, the Olam Haba, the pleasure that the souls in the next world have, uh, and that they enjoy this, that the, what what is that pleasure that they're having? They're the the souls of the tzaddikim in the next world. They're basking in the radiance of the shechina that is shining upon them in the supernal and in the lower Ganeidin. And what is this enjoyment that they're having? They're enjoying their understanding and their comprehension and their in, their conception of all kinds of different things. Like it's it's a, it's an intellectual kind of enjoyment. So it's like our world is a world of confusion. We've often often talked about that, right? And so the amazing thing in the in the next world in Ganadian, especially for the Tzadikim, is that's where they actually do have some semblance of knowledge, some type of understanding of the light and of the vitality that is radiates there from the from God, from the infinite one in a in a revealed way to their to their souls and to the spirit of their understanding each one according to their level and according to their deeds so it's like here in this world the tzaddikim it's like you know they're working they're toiling they're trying to best can serve god and then in the next world they're kind of like that's where they get to receive the fruits of their labor like now they really get to bask in the fruits of their labor labor and this world to come is called bina in the zohar in the holy zohar and where does this this uh this flow come from? This comes from the supernal Chochmah, which is the origin of this understanding, which is called Bina. So Chochmah, so in, remember in the train of the of the ten spheros, the origin Chochmah comes before Bina. So ch- the origin of Bina is in Chochmah. And now what is this Chochmah that we're talking about? This is the the primordial stage of the mind before it becomes revealed in the understanding and and um, conception of Bina. And it's still in this concealed state. And it's only that just like a little bit of this ray, this radiance comes down and is revealed in the realm of Bina in order to understand, to be able to understand somewhat of of the hidden state. So it's like a little bit of what's hidden becomes a slightly revealed. And this is why the Zohar, how does the Zohar refer to Chochmah? The Zohar refers to Chochmah as being the Nekuda Behechala, the dot in the, in the palace. Uh, so what does that mean? So if you think about, like, if you if you know what the shape of the letters Yud and He look like, you can think of He as kind of like this house or like this palace kind of state. And then the Yud is like much smaller. So it's kind of like just like the, the Chochmah, that's the point inside of the palace. So... So this is indeed when we look at the in the name of Yud Kei Vav Kei, the Yud, the role there is like just like this very small dot. And it's called what else is the Chachma called? So on the one hand, we could say that it's the dot in the palace. We can also call it Eden. What does Eden mean? What is Eden? Like we think of Gun Eden, right? Like the Garden of Eden or whatever. So it's so about Eden, about this this idea, this concept, this place of Eden, Yeshayahu in chapter 64, verse 3, calls it Ein Lorata, that no eye sees it. It's like something a little bit beyond our grasp. We can't quite, it's like when you have a sense of something, right? But you don't really, you can't really quite, quite, quite grasp it. That's what Chochma is. That's what the Yud is. And now the ultra Rebbe brings us an interesting teaching in the Zohar, which says that Abba Yesad Balta, that the father founded the daughter. So what does that mean? The father founded the daughter. Uh, so in order to understand this, we have to, again, look at that map of the of the spheros again and understand what that means. So when we say father, what we're referring to here is Chochmah. Chochmah we can think of as the father. It's this masculine energy. It's the origin. It's the source of all the other spheros. And then when we say daughter, what are we referring to as the daughter? The daughter here is we're talking about the letters of speech. And as we'll see, and the letters of speech in this case is Malchus. Malchus is the lowest of all the spheres. So this 
at first glance might seem really strange because it's like, you know, there's a progressive map of the of the spheres. So you would think if we're talking about like speech is Malchus, you would think, okay, where does Malchus come from? Above Malchus is the six Midos. So you would think, okay, maybe it comes from the six Midos, right? But in fact, no, we're saying that it actually, there's a connection between speech, which is the lowest of all the faculties, Malchus, and the highest of the faculties, which is Chochmah. So what does this mean? This means that if you really think about it, when we think about how, okay, what is chokhmah? Chokhmah is something that's beyond intellect, it's beyond understanding. So this means that the bringing about of the letters of speech and the five organs of articulation that allow us to speech is not actually something intellectual. It's not something rational. And also when we think about these, these organs of verbal articulation, it's like, it's not, there's nothing about them inherently that would bring about the pronunciation of these letters, right? Uh, through the, the breath and the, and the voice, the sound that comes out of them. It's, this isn't something innate to them and it's not something rational either. For example, what do we mean by this? When you think about the lips, for example, which the lips are a big part of speech. Think about like when you're speaking, how much your lips are involved. And the, and in, in Hebrew, Actually, we can break down the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and each one of them is associated with different parts of our speech. So in for when we talk about the, the lips, the letters of speech, which are associated with, with lips, are the bet, right? So bet, so think about it. You say b, b. Then there's the vav, v, so v, right? Mem, mem is another one, so m. And pe, p, or, or fe, even f. And also for vest, also is v. So all of those involve the lips in some capacity or another. But nevertheless, the lips, there's nothing about the lips. Like if you just like look at somebody, you look at their lips. It's, it's actually, we take it for granted. We take it for granted that that's where that sound comes out of it. But it's like, it's just lips. It's just like flesh. Like who would have thought that that's how we make all these amazing letters that make all these amazing sounds? Like... It's not, it, it's not something innate to them and it's not something rational. It's like if, if you just were to take these like lips on their own, it's like, you know, who would think that this is like, this is how you're going to make speech come out of them. And also these letters, they all make different sounds, right? Bet, vet, mem, pe, each one is a different sound, m, p, whatever, you know, and so nevertheless, it's the same, there's the same breath and the same sound that's striking them in an equal way, but yet it creates all these different letters. And so, okay, so what is, what does make the difference? What is it about, like, what is going on? What allows us to say these different, uh, these different utterances that to, to pronounce these different sounds, if it's not explicitly our lips, like it's not just our lips alone, and it's not just the the like breath coming from our throat that's doing that something else is going on so what is that so ultimately what it is is our will is the power of will that we decide ultimately we say we're going to say the letter bet or vav or mem or pay we make this decision i'm going to say these letters and we do it so there's some kind of interesting like jump that happens we want to say something and we say it so it's kind of like if you think about it these these organs of verbal articulation are like they're like a slave to our will and to what we want to say and it's not the other way around it's not like we say it's not like here I am like Sarid saying like I want to move my lips in this like bring my lips together and really pierce them together and then oh wow that's so cool it makes a buh sound you know like that's not what happens it's like I decide to make that buh sound and then the buh sound comes out it's not that I decide to move my lips in a specific way and like we see this practically, like imagine how like weird it would be if we had to actually do that. If like every time we wanted to speak, we had to like really like uh, consciously think to ourselves, okay, I need to move my lips like this, move my teeth in this direction, make sure my tongue is out of the way. Like that's, you know, it's, it's like, it, it wouldn't really work. It would be like very, 
strange like it's hard for us to even imagine that and even like little kids you see them like little kids aren't like sitting there consciously like practicing moving their lips this way practicing their tongue this way whatever you know like I said there are times when a speech therapist might come in and like kind of like work on like the mechanisms involved but the basics are there the basics of like if a child once a child is ready to speak he speaks or she speaks it's like it's it happens in this more natural kind of way that all the the uh, the organ, the organs of verbal articulation come together, and the altar epic goes on, and he says that we see this even more uh, pronounced when it comes to the vowels. So the vowels, which in Hebrew it's like the vowels are not letters like we have in English, but they're actually like just different dots and signs like around the the letters. So for example, if um if somebody wants to pronounce the the vowel kamatz that's called in Hebrew, then in the way that that's pronounced, at least like in Ashkenazi terms, which is a little, just as a side note, it's a little bit different for like my regular um, pronunciation. In Israeli Hebrew, the kamatz and the patach are kind of not so distinguishable in that way, but I'll try to the best of my ability to pronounce the kamatz in an Ashkenazi term way, which is o, right? So when you say that o sound, then it's my mouth, you can try to do that sound yourself, o, it's like you're, you're, your lips are becoming a little bit more compressed, right? Like your whole, um, the, you need to compress your lips a little bit versus when you, when you say the, when you use the patach vowel, the sound for the patach is ah, ah, so the lips open and they do this on their own. So it's like, if you're familiar with these vowels, these, these sounds, it's not like I'm thinking to myself, I need to compress my mouth and that's how I'm going to make that sound of oh it's more like I want to make this sound oh and then my lips automatically compress so it's, it's a very subtle difference but it's a big difference it's like what is dictating what it's like I decide to make a sound and my my mouth follows my body follows it's not like I decide to move my body in a specific way and then a sound emerges from it you know so really think about that and so and that and that's exactly what the what the ultra orbit says. He says it's not that like our will is telling us to compress our lips or to open our lips or any of that kind of thing. Uh, and so and then the ultra orbit says we don't need to elaborate upon this. This is something that's very simple and very understandable to everybody. Like it's not something we can really argue about. It's very simple. It's like you know that you uh, that when you want to say certain when you want to pronounce certain letters and certain vowels, then this comes from a place that is above intellect and that's above comprehension. So where does it come from? It comes from this hidden place of the kadmus hasechel. It's called the hidden intellect or the primordial intellect, the part of the intellect that is above this um, this stage of like just of comprehension and rationality. And it's within the nefesh hamadabelet and the articulate soul. So it's like we all are articulate souls. We all are speaking souls, but it comes, the place that this speech originates from is in this like higher intellect kind of place. And then the ultra bit concludes and he says, this is how I started the podcast actually, that this is why, now we can understand why it is that an infant, a, a baby cannot speak, even though they understand everything. So it's like, why? Because basically as mentioned in the beginning, babies do understand. They understand a lot more than we think they do. They're not like as out of it as they think they do. They're taking in everything. But what they don't have is they don't have that chokhmah developed. They don't have that higher supernal rational part of their brain developed at least not in a revealed way and in order for them to speak in order for anybody to speak that part of the brain it's specifically the chokhmah that needs to be manifest it's specifically that level so this is sort of like an introduction to like a much bigger topic and we're going to continue with this tomorrow so stay tuned and i will speak to you then thanks for listening to the it is top podcast hosted by sarid switzer this podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Avraham Yitzchak ben Benyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Top project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.